We've got news from the world of media, automotive. We'll dip into the full mailbag. Let's start with energy. Shares of Halliburton falling a little bit after first quarter revenue fell more than 40%. They're cutting 6,000 jobs, Taylor, Mm -hmm. and, and I cannot believe this is ever a good sign. They've delayed their earnings call. Yes, they have, till May 3rd. So that's <laughs> because it's going to be amazing on May 3rd or because, wow, this is terrible and we've got to get our ducks in a row? <laughs> because it's curiously after the date of April 30th, which is when the deal between them and Baker Hughes can officially be called off by either party. So many people are expecting that Halliburton is kind of hedging its bets here so that they can present themselves as a standalone entity on May 3rd rather than presenting them as potentially a combined entity with Baker Hughes if they do decide to call it off um, after this week is over. So Baker Hughes could potentially walk away with $3.5 billion of Halliburton's money. Um, that being said, the pre-release wasn't terrible. They, I mean, the margins looked better. Aside from a, a couple billion dollar impairment charge, um, results were better than everyone expected for the most part. But you just said they're about to get. I mean, yeah, they're going to lose a third you, of their cash. As you said, <laughs> at this point, the no one is betting that the Baker Hughes deal goes yeah, through. As soon as the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against them, people pretty much baked it into the stock price that this is like ninety nine percent not going to happen. So it's baked in that they're about to write a check for another three and a half billion dollars. That's what people are saying. Yeah, uh, I mean, is that in fact the case though? Because I, I we I guess we were talking about this a little bit. I mean, will that actually is that actually going to be the case? Because I mean, if you have a situation where neither party actually called off the transaction, mm-hmm. um, I mean, they're being told that they can't move forward with it. So then, does is there language in there that actually holds Halliburton liable in this case if if for some reason regulators don't let the transaction go through? Um, I believe there is if yeah. regulators don't allow it, um, and especially if Baker Hughes just says we're done. This is taking way too long. You gave us till April 30th, and now it's beyond that. We want to operate as our own. We want to just forego this. So if Baker Hughes pulls out, definitely, and I'm, I'm nearly certain that if they prolong it, if they both stick stick with the deal, and then suddenly regulators are like, you know what, we've had enough. This is definitely not happening. I'm pretty sure that Halliburton still has to pay that money, um, regardless. Let's go to the job cuts for a second, yeah. because this is—I mean—we're we're now in year two mm-hmm. of large energy companies saying it doesn't look good in the near future for yep. the price of oil. Therefore, we've got to cut costs, which means in this case, cutting jobs. Is this—I mean—is there a light at the end of the tunnel, or should we expect to see more of this coming from other energy companies this earnings season? Well, Schlumberger announced its own significant job cuts in the first quarter of this year as well. Um, Obviously, it's the biggest competitor to to Halliburton, the biggest company in the equipment and services industry. So, they're still feeling the pain just as badly. Um, You started to see some of these service companies like Core Labs expects a a V-shaped recovery to start somewhat in the second quarter, maybe the third quarter of this year. Um, Halliburton does think that the bottom of the the rig decline will happen sometime in the second quarter, so they're hoping that at least the decline flatlines, um, if not starts to recover. Um, so you see the price of oil increasing, but that still doesn't impact them necessarily until activity picks up. Um, and then I saw a, a report from Deloitte saying that upwards of 175 exploration and production companies. Could go bank, could file for bankruptcy this year, which would be a third globally. So um, there's still, and that, if that happens, then you're then that's a third of their potential customers gone bankrupt. That doesn't mean that they're going to stop doing business, but it does mean that they're going to have to scale back even further. So will there be a, a recovery for this company throughout the year? I'm not going to bet on that, but I'm going to bet on them long term for sure. I think that. Maybe says everything you need to know about the oil industry that Taylor laid out. That flatlining is the is the good scenario. Yeah, people are definitely hoping, at least in the service. Unlike in sector. life, yeah. where <laughs> someone flatlines and it's all over, and they move to the great beyond. Yeah, we're rooting for flatlining, Jason. Sure. Well, I mean, I think you look at the uh, you look at it from Halliburton's perspective. You look at it from Schlumberger's perspective. You think about it beyond the energy industry. I mean, think about the banks that have. Uh, 
loans outstanding with a lot of these oil companies, especially mm-hmm. the smaller ones. I mean, we've seen this play out before, where there are going to be banks that are going to have to deal with sort of the, the ramifications of these of these loans that that might not be paid back. And there's no question that when you when you look at Halliburton and Schlumberger, for example, I think they're two very good indicators of of really what's going on. The 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 good part, I think, for investors at least, is these are two of the biggest companies in the space. Mm-hmm. They're going to be able to weather those those financial yep. uh, headwinds, even even you know if if Halliburton does have to pay that uh, that that what three billion dollars three and a half and billion. It looks and they like have that's about ten billion case. in cash. Yeah. I think uh, we saw Halliburton CEO Dave uh, Lassar said. Uh, quote, what we are experiencing today is far beyond headwinds. It's unsustainable. My definition of an unsustainable market is one where all service companies are losing money in North America, which is where we are now. Yeah. End quote. I mean, Schlumberger didn't have any any anything to really counter that either. I mean, they, they basically see this just huge cash crisis. And so, the companies that have balance sheets that can withstand this will be able to Sort of batten down the hatches and deal with the storm, um, and, and honestly, as as bad as it sounds right now, this is when you really need to be looking at maybe investing in some of these companies. I mean, this is when you need to be considering uh, possibly some exposure here, and and so we have some exposure to these businesses. Halliburton is is one of the companies in Million Dollar Portfolio. Uh, we bought it with with the assumption that it was a matter of when, not if. Things turn around, mm-hmm. and we're still waiting. The wind hasn't come around yet, but this is this is actually a pretty good sign that maybe things are kind of hitting a bottom. The company has done really relatively well in the market too. It's somewhat sure. outperformed uh, the energy sector. Um, so you you still want to? I, I, if I was going to reinvest some more money into Halliburton, I'm waiting until after April 30th, just because I'm already a shareholder. So I'm not I'm not sensing any reason to put more money at risk in case this deal does officially go south and people decide to sell off a little bit. But if it does, that could be a great buying opportunity. And to the point on the banks, they've kind of been doing their best job at pushing maybe some bankruptcies off a little bit because they've they've helped finance several billion dollars in equity raises just in the last couple of months. Um, might not be the ultimate solution, but at least it's pushing off a potential end date for some of these companies' lifetimes. Yeah, and for Halliburton, I mean, you look at three and a half billion dollars Sounds like a lot of money because yeah. it is a lot of money. But <laughs> yes, it by is. By the same token, uh, I mean Halliburton is a thirty-five billion dollar market cap company in bad times with a little bit more than ten billion dollars in cash and equivalents on the balance sheet. So they certainly have the resources to deal with this adversity mm-hmm. uh, in the near term, and, and it's not going to really ding them too terribly hard uh, as as things improve. It'll be interesting to see what Baker Hughes does with that money if they're just giving sure. three and a half yeah. billion. Personally, I think that. They they go out and buy some of these cash strap businesses themselves. What would you do with three and a half billion dollars? Buy an island. Uh, I, yeah, I would, but and... they probably won't. <laughs> the number one performing stock on the New York Stock Exchange today is Tribune Publishing. Shares are up fifty six percent after Gannett made an unsolicited bid to buy Tribune Publishing in a deal worth eight hundred fifteen million dollars. People may be slightly unfamiliar with those names, Jason. They are probably more familiar with the properties that these two companies own. And so, think of it as the company that owns USA Today is trying to buy the company that owns the Chicago Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. And there are other media, smaller media properties within the, both of those companies. Mm-hmm. But this seems like, as we've seen with other industries in the past, this seems like one of those bids where Gannett said, here's a big offer, we want you to take it right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely it's a, it's a premium offer. Uh, we're in the midst of this big sort of media shift, where just the entire media landscape is changing. And uh, I think the big question today, I, I, perhaps investors need to be asking, is what's worth more, the information or the brand that is giving it to you. And I think a time ago, the brand that gave it to us mattered more. Um, in the days of the New York Times, for example, the newspaper of record, right? And and I, so I, you look at you look at those names that that hold sort of a lot of sway here, historically speaking. Those brands, those names, really used to matter. Um, now, information is really just a commodity, and we can get it. Anywhere, pretty much any time, for very little, if if any cost. 
which puts all of these newspaper companies in a, in a real bind. And so, I mean, we're we're seeing a lot of consolidation here. Uh, we we see Warren Buffett obviously has has been very bullish on newspapers in in the sense that they are sort of the 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 record of of information for communities for smaller sort of uh, localities uh, maybe not so much maybe not as effective on a national scale because because of the way that the media space has changed but, but there are plenty of places around the country where you're not going to be able to get that kind of local information any place other than maybe a newspaper that doesn't necessarily make it a great investment but um, as we make this shift from from paper to digital and uh, all of these different sorts of properties that give us this information beyond just the names of, of the the newspapers I mean I think that's something you have to consider and and if you look at the New York Times this is a very interesting story here revenue over the past 10 years of the New York Times has been cut in half and I mean they've been trying to make this shift into sort of a digital model which is I, I you could argue they were late to the game there but but it's better late than never and and perhaps they're able to uh, do okay with that, but I don't know that I'd necessarily be holding my breath there. Again, I mean, I think it's just a matter of you need to be unique. You need you need to offer something that that other people don't offer. And we were talking about this earlier before taping. It's everywhere from ESPN to newspapers and and everywhere in between. They're all feeling this uh, in some form or another today. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that there are within the tribune you can look at tribune publishing which is a stock that has been cut in half and then some over the past year since it got spun out from tribune media and there are still within that business specific entities and and mainly i'm thinking about the los angeles times that are that are making it like if you're if you're gannett you're looking at this thinking okay well we can get the chicago tribune and we can get the la times and yes we'll have some other Smaller properties within that, but those are really the two that we want, and and that makes sense to me. Um, by the same token, uh, as I said before, I think this is this is just a we want to get this done as quickly as possible yeah. because yeah. We, you know it, right if you just look at the newspaper industry within the United States, Gannett has the largest market share. They got about twelve percent, and uh, Tribune Publishing has about five percent. So this would this would just further pad Gannett's lead if this goes through. Apparently, they've presented this to management at the Tribune Publishing, but they kind of shot it down. And so maybe this deal is a little bit more outlandish, over a 60% premium, because they want to go directly to shareholders. And as a shareholder, your shares are down at least 50% if you've been a longtime shareholder. Maybe you get a 63% boost and then cash out, or, you, or you're a shareholder of a bigger company. Um, so this deal. I think it was probably a little bit more inflated than what they originally presented to Tribune management. I think they're going after shareholders, and I know they're going after employees at Tribune Publishing, That's because part <laughs> yeah. of the statement from the CEO at Gannett was aimed directly at Tribune employees, saying, hey, we want you to be part of our growing empire, and mm-hmm. there are going to be opportunities for advancement. Yeah, I mean, think about the leverage they have there, because it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the journalism profession has taken a real big hit here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the data is clear in that there there are fewer journalists today than there were a, a year ago. It's projected to continue on that trend as as it becomes uh, a, a a less sustainable. It's just really difficult to make a living doing it, right? I mean, and, and again, it just kind of goes back to the internet has basically given everybody a voice, and that's great um, unless you made your living that way, and then it's sort of uh, offered up some challenges. But uh, again, I mean, I think. You have to be a property that offers something unique, and and so you look at Sirius XM Radio, for example. There was consolidation there, sort of a unique way to distribute that content. I would make the argument that that once Howard Stern is not a part of that uh, business anymore, they're going to have a real problem. Um, luckily for them, they've wrapped up his content. I think for the next twelve years, so that's good for <laughs> them. Look at it, uh, the Washington Post, right? Um, Jeff Bezos buys Washington Post. Now you have sort of this. Property that he's he's got a number of different ways he could play that. I mean, he could make that uh, part of the prime relationship. He can offer that as just a very cheap distri- uh, digital uh, uh, subscription for for prime members or whatever. A number of different ways he can do it to make it unique. And so I think that's the key is we're going to see more consolidation. And and again, I think they want to focus on having something unique to make them stand out because otherwise you're just uh, a drop in a big ocean. Sergio Marchionne is the head of Fiat Chrysler. He's been saying for some time that the auto industry would benefit from some consolidation, and he appears to have picked his next dance partner, Ford Motor. 
CEO Mark Fields was asked about this over the weekend and very politely said, no, thank you. <laughs> That's, you know what? If nothing else, you got to admire the chutzpah of a guy who says, I've got a $10 billion company. You've got a $54 billion company. We should merge. Let's sure. talk. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, admire his chutzpah, I guess, whatever. Uh, I, this could always change. And I mean, I mean, we know that things, things change very quickly. I cannot imagine any scenario where Mark Fields actually wants this to happen, though. Um, the only reason I could see this actually happening, there are two reasons. Either A, Mark Fields quits his job as the CEO and, and the person who fills his role wants to do this. Or or B, Mark Fields truly believes that what Alan Mulally helped execute in turning this business around really didn't work out very well. And, and I think the numbers would, the numbers would argue that it has worked out pretty well. Um, the whole the whole reason why Ford has been able to make it is that they had the wherewithal to shed all of those just tangential brands that didn't really matter to the core operations. They tightened up their operations and they got rid of the you know, they, they they cut the fat. Uh, this to me would just be adding more fat. But I mean, there's no reason in the world why they would need to bring Fiat in there. It would ultimately. I just think cause problems down the road. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think it could be a distraction in a time where these big automotive companies could use a little less distraction. Yeah. Um, they have other things to concentrate on, and and Mark Field seems to be concentrating on those important things. Talking about four and a half billion dollars invested in autonomous and electric vehicles. Um, Forty percent of their vehicles could be offered electronically, um, and by the end of this decade, so. He's got some bigger fish to fry, I think, than trying to roll in a few other car brands uh, from a company that hasn't done quite as well as his over the last few years. And I think it's a great point he makes. They're bringing up the electronic vehicles or the electric vehicles, kind of things of yeah, the future. Electric, yeah. um, it, Mark Fields had to kind of wait for this job, right? I mean, there was a point where he thought he was actually going to get that job. The, the powers that be said, well, wait, let's. Not quite yet. We don't think you're ready. Work under Malali here for a little bit, learn a little bit more. And he he was he was good to be patient and sort of take a back seat. He he waited his time. Now he's got this role. So I, I think this is not a CEO job that was just handed to him. He, he, you could argue that he earned it. And I think he's excited about about taking this company forward uh, in, in not really. A merger with with Fiat would would really just be taking it backward. Yeah, because you you have to imagine Marcioni is not going to take a backseat to most no, people I, if he decide if probably he bigger to, egos involved. Yeah. And yeah, it would just cause a lot of trouble. At Market Foolery is our Twitter handle from Tim Wrights in Charlotte, North Carolina. Any hey, chance right. of periscoping <laughs> when the Motley Fool employees first see the Cobra sake bottle and taste it? No, there's no chance. <laughs> there's no. I like how yeah, you're thinking. The, the yeah. assumption there is that someone's actually going to drink that. No, has it, has I'm it been not opened? jumping in it on that. Not one. It's not been opened. Yet. <laughs> like I said, like I said last week, I bet we can get someone to. If we get someone to do it, I'll I'll gladly periscope. <laughs> I I will I will lead that. I will spearhead. We'll that have initiative. to do it out on the patio just in case it doesn't settle too well. Well, just we've got. I think we've got like a podcast happy hour on Wednesday. That's true. Let's Maybe. go ahead and see if anybody's Celebrate. got the stones to step up and do it. <laughs> Marketfoolery at fool.com is our email address from Caleb Krug in Arkansas. Just wanted to say congrats on reaching 1,000 episodes. I've been listening for about two years now and I've enjoyed every minute and I've learned a lot. Whenever my friends have questions about starting to invest, I give them a quick crash course and send them to the Motley Fool podcast to start learning more as we can continue to talk through it. Recently, I was talking with my girlfriend about finances, and she said she didn't know very much about investing. I partially <laughs> joked that that's what I was for. And then she asked me a serious question. Are you good at investing? <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit... I already love Caleb's girlfriend. <laughs> I was a bit unsure how to answer. I said that I thought I was, but I had never really checked. I decided to benchmark my portfolio returns against the S&P 500 and found I was beating the S&P 500 by at least 10% annualized. I realize I haven't been investing very long, and this has been a very good time to be an investor, but it was still encouraging. I wanted to say thanks to everyone there for helping to teach a relatively new investor how to invest foolishly. I look forward to helping others along the path as I continue learning from all of you. So, thank you. That's a wonderful note. That's what and, we're here uh, for. Yeah. And um, uh, just the whole spirit of investing together is, is uh, fabulous. Um, again, 
I only know one thing about her, but I love the girlfriend. Just like, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, hotshot. How good are you? Humility. At that? Remember yeah. humility. Yeah. That but, will always but make you good. great that, you know, not only he uses it as the impetus to check how he's doing against yeah. the S&P yeah. 500, but also to have the wherewithal to, to just step back and say, well, this is good for now, but this is, as Morgan Housel will say, this is, this is a, a small time frame in terms of a data set. Sure. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I mean, yeah. I, I've... Geez, man. I mean, I've been investing for, I guess, really since I was probably about thirteen or so, um, and it's it's still. I mean, I'm forty three now, so it's it's just you measure your success over really the course of your life, and and always, always remain humble because as soon as you think you've got it figured out, much like golf, <laughs> you don't. Taylor Ruckerman, Jason Moser, thanks for being here, guys. Mm-hmm. Thank you. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So, don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's going to do it for this edition of Market Foolery. The show is mixed by Dan Boyd. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.